the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. We are on to the third part of the marriage series, and um, I'm going to introduce my dad tonight. He gets to talk to all the men of God. So come on up, Dad. And as he's coming up, we had made a video. And I, I, I have not seen the video, but I heard it's funny. And so the Mary's Retreat had a video. And remember last week, Pastor Deborah tried to start it and didn't work. Well, listen, we really worked hard and we got it all set up for you, okay? Well, here's how this works so they, they'll understand. Debbie and I say it like it is. She, I'm not, you've heard me say this. She's strong-willed, and I'm strong-willed. How do you say it? Uh, John Wayne's son married who? Betty Friedman's daughter. I'm John not sure who Betty Friedman. Betty Friedman. She started the woman's lib. Okay, Betty Friedman's daughter did. You have to be a little really old to know that. And uh, so, and so Deb and I just like and so you know we have a lot of employees and we have staff meetings and and we get in each other's business. Is anybody married getting in the other person's business? I think that's a nice way of saying we tick each other off at times. So they asked the staff. I wasn't in the video. I know. They asked the staff, what do you think about Jim and Debbie's marriage? Or how do you, you know. Well, don't give away too much. Okay. Let's play, Let's we'll play, play it. it. Let's okay. Do Love you guys. Enjoy Love the video. You too, pal. Yeah, but I don't feel like you should talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Shut up, Debbie. Shut up, Debbie. Let's get it done. <laughs> no, because it's kind of embarrassing. Well, my, we won't be there, though. I was, think, I was thinking, like, sometimes you say, I just want to strangle her. <laughs> but God calls me to love her, so I love her. But uh, maybe that's not good. I only do what my wife wants. <laughs> That's how I've been successful. I'm the boss. That's no, good. You are the boss. We're supposed to be talking about Pastor Jim and okay. how they've been. Pastor example. Deborah's the boss. <laughs> there was a day Jess and I were just dating, and I came over to the Cobra household. And as I walk in, everybody's in the, the kitchen. They have the kind of the kitchen great room type thing, and they're all standing around this massive island in the middle of the kitchen. And in the middle of them all is a large bowl of taco salad. Pastor Deborah had made taco salad. Normally, she makes the best taco salad. And so everybody's standing around and they're all smiling. But it's not the smile of like, we're so happy that we're eating this wonderful taco salad. They're all smiling like something's up. And I'm kind of walking in going, hi everybody. And they said, oh Dan, hey, you're just in time for dinner. Why don't you have some taco salad? And so I am staring at everybody going, something's up going on here um, and I don't know I'm not I haven't been let in on the joke yet so I grab a bowl of taco salad and I'm looking down at the taco salad I put my fork in and get a bite and as I'm lifting it up to my mouth I look up and everybody is leaning in <laughs> smiling at me staring at me and I'm going what what's going on here and they said go ahead eat so I put the taco salad in my mouth and I start to chew and it took everything in me. Pastor Deborah, I love you with all my heart, but it took everything in me to hold my composure and keep a straight face. It's and everybody horrible. looked at me and they said, what do you think, Dan? And I went, mmm, because this is gonna be my future mother-in-law and so I've gotta make sure that she and me are on good terms. And at that moment, everybody burst into laughter and they all said, Dan, we know it doesn't taste good. You're a liar. And Pastor Deborah grabbed her taco salad. She said, the whole that's bowl. it. She grabbed the whole bowl. She grabbed my bowl and threw it in her bowl, grabbed a fork and said, fine. If you guys don't like it, I'm going to eat it myself. And she ran up to her room and Jess and I walked up there and here she is on her bed with this massive bowl of taco <laughs> salad in the middle of the bed, just eating away. And she's just chewing away and she's chomping. And we looked at her and we said, Mom, do you really, bad, do you really think that that's good? And she goes, no, it tastes terrible. I hate it. I hate it, but I'm not going to let them know that. And honestly, 
I think that's the funniest story. This is the wrong food. I mean, my dad and spaghetti. Oh my gosh, if you touch my dad's spaghetti sauce, oh. mm -hmm. you are an evil person. And dad thinks that mom is on a conspiracy the to ruin. touch his spaghetti sauce every time he makes it. He'll whisper in my ear, well, she's gonna put something in it when I walk away. And then, if it's not the, to his liking, he's like, I know your mother loves this. I know she did. And it's just, they're hilarious when it comes to food. It is the funniest thing. I mean, he's always making fun of her cooking. I don't, I don't know if I think that's funny because I remember one day, you know, I was just dwelling through my cooking. I don't like it. So I feel kind of hard to have to Grandpa loves chasing around grandma. It was mom's 40th birthday. And all summer long and all fall long because her birthday's in November, we were asking her, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to have? What do you want to celebrate? You know, what do you want for your birthday? And she just kept saying nothing, nothing, nothing. I don't, I, this is a birthday I don't want to remember. This is something that I don't want to, you know, don't get me anything, no party, no nothing. Don't do anything for my, and so I remember dad, uh, I remember the day of mom's birthday came around and we didn't get her anything. <laughs> we, he didn't do anything. He didn't get her a present. We didn't get her a present. We didn't throw her a party or make a special dinner. It was just a regular day. And I remember the look on his face. You know that look you see every once in a while on somebody's face when it's like the oh crud, like I really dropped the ball on this one. And he uh, he ran out that day, like in the evening. And yeah, he went to some department store. You know, they didn't have the stores all over the place like they did now. So he went to some department store somewhere. And I think he bought her a really nice bracelet or watch or ring or something. Just came back kind of crawling in with the tail between his legs, you know, on his knees like, I'm sorry I did that. And, uh, you know, since then, almost every year she said she didn't want anything or she didn't want to do anything for her birthday. But we as a family learned that nothing means something. Pastor Jim always makes it very clear that he's so in love with Pastor Debbie. Uh, and that's always really cool that, it, you know, he's not afraid to show that and not too macho to be, um, I don't know, gushy about Pastor Deborah. What I admire about them is that they are the real deal. What you see is what you get. And they're very open about their relationship and they're very open about the ups and the downs. And they really just set the example for us. Um, I think Pastor Jim and Deborah, they really do model biblical marriage very well. Pastor Jim um, has gone over many times and you, it, you can see that it's in his in his heart and in his spirit to do what the Bible says, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a husband, how to lead his wife, how to lead his family. I have to tell you a little story, a couple of things. Men, wisdom is when your wife says, I don't want anything for her birthday, do not listen. <laughs> Doesn't matter, I don't care how broke you are, go get something and make it as nice as you can and make it a surprise and write lovely things on there. Even though you're not into that stuff, oh, you know, but write it anyway. Like, I love you, you're adorable, you're wonderful. They want to hear that and actually, biblically, they need to hear that. So it's very, very important. I'll tell you a little story about taco salad, if I may. <laughs> Deborah is, if you haven't noticed, is more, she's beyond gringo. There's gringos and then there's the uh, fluorescents. She is a fluorescent white person. And, uh, and so, you know, there's white people and then there's fluorescent white people. Debbie is the tanometer for everybody. She doesn't get a tan. And everybody, you know, kind of like, if you have a tan in the summer, you check how much you're getting your tan by putting your arm up against hers because she doesn't tan. So she's, she's, so she's a gringo and she make, she likes Mexican food. So she, she does good on some of it when she's thinking, when she's not thinking, it's different. And, um, and <laughs> you notice how I said different, not stinks. I said different, so let's don't, let's don't go there. And so uh, I think I'm in trouble already, you know? And so she, she, what she did that night is that White people put in a, like, Lowry's taco sauce to make taco salad for flavoring. You know what I'm talking about? Any white people in here that know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you, the rest of you make your own, you know what I'm saying? And so she takes uh, the Lowry's taco sauce and she puts it in. She usually has pretty doggone good taco salad. We all love it. This night, she didn't have any taco sauce. Uh, the taco dried flavoring thing that you tear open. So she had enchilada sauce. 
And I don't know if you know that enchilada tastes different than tacos. Anybody got an amen on that? I mean, some of you, come on, some of you Hispanic girls, I expect to have a big amen on that, or, or we're really in trouble. And so when she made it with enchilada flavoring, she thought she was going to get by with it. <laughs> she, she didn't get by with it at all. And uh, so I, I, but most of the time, she is a fabulous cook. And uh, she does mess up my spaghetti. When I'm not looking, she'll taste it and then put stuff in that she thinks ought to go in. Which, and she says she doesn't do that, but I've caught her. Look at her saying no over there. I've caught her. And, uh, and it's like, oh no, no, this is, no. See what I'm saying, guys? See what I'm saying here? You know what I'm talking about? Oh no. I don't, okay, hey, wait a minute. Okay, it's on. This is why my inner shell. <laughs> the devil made me do it. This is why my inner chef is completely crucified. And there is no possibility of it ever being resurrected. Because my family is merciless with my cooking. So I have decided, so all of you that are feeling sorry for Pastor Jim because his wife doesn't cook for him, try living with him 35 years, being the brunt of pulpit jokes, having the entire world know that you're a lousy cook and that you're fluorescent. <laughs> A fluorescent lousy cook. So, a fluorescent lousy cook. You know, all I can say is that love covers a multitude of sins. No, okay. All right. You got me on that one. And even though I may not be a cook that you like, and I promise I don't touch your spaghetti sauce. I don't, I don't, before the Lord, I don't Liars touch it. Well, fry. sometimes I've touched it. You know what? Nothing. I'm going to go. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> my. Jeez. Lord, help us. Let me get down on my knees and pray because Deborah really needs God. <laughs> and some of you also may need God. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just love you and thank you for your time to, for us tonight. Thank you for the, your presence in this place. Thank you that the Spirit of the Lord is here and it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. But I love the part about joy. We can laugh, Lord, and enjoy you. We're in a different kind of a party here on earth. We're partying with our Jesus and the joy that doesn't go out, and the joy that doesn't stop, and the joy that's not just for a night or a moment, are about something, but our joy is our strength that you give us, and we're grateful. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be, and Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Now, let me just say a couple of things before we get into the Word of God, that uh, not always did Debbie and I see things the same. I think that's kind of the fun thing, I, and you don't either with your wife, if you and husband are always seeing things the same, and then you don't even need to be in this class. You need to actually just be teaching us how to do that, because I don't know how to do that. We think differently. We've got our own opinions about stuff. We've got our own strengths. We have, um, uh, we're both pretty tough people. We look at a problem, and we, you know, we look through the problem, and we don't land on a problem. We're both pretty tough that way. But oftentimes, we're tough with each other, and um, but there's 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 ways of doing things that that really are healthy. You know, if you stop and think about this just for a moment, I I, I need to tell you, like Debbie and I are 
uh, and kind of not a big deal, but kind of disagreement about my hair. Uh, I want to grow it. She wants to cut it. And, and I'm not sure what to do. Man, day is coming. So I settled by growing my beard back. And, and that is, she said, that looks good, but your hair doesn't look good. And uh, so, um, I don't know, I thought I'd take a survey before we get serious into the word <laughs> and let you in on our marriage to make a decision. I'm going to give you a few choices. Number one choice, let it grow. Yeah. Wait a minute. Number two choice, get a haircut. Yeah. Number three choice, shave the sucker. <laughs> Number four choice, I don't give a flip. <laughs> Is that okay? Because I'm old, and I'd really love to let my hair grow and let it down to my knees, <laughs> like Moses. But um, then the kids, I'd really be Santa Claus in a couple of months, you know. So number one choice was let it grow. Number two is get a haircut. Number three is shave your head. I ain't doing that, so you might as well not vote for that. And, and number four is, I don't give a flip what you do. Oh, shut up. <laughs> she yelled out, do what your wife told you to do. And she yelled it with attitude, too. <laughs> oh, man, that ain't going to happen. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so I really need your help. I'll, I'll raise your hand if you think it's number one. Number one is let your hair grow. You really say you're not going to say let your hair grow? All right, number two, shave that sucker. No, no, number two was get a haircut. Oh, look at you. Man, they're, they're awful. Number three, what was number three? Shave your head. Oh, my goodness. Four, all the bald headed guys in here are doing it. Look at you, John. John, stand up. You're prejudiced. And number four, which is I don't give a flip. So you, all the I don't give a flips go to number one. So that's a tie. So, in other words, I didn't get anywhere. Ephesians, fifth chapter. One of the neat things about the Rock Church World Outreach Center, if you haven't figured it out yet, is there are different types of churches out there, all of which God backs and all of which are wonderful. Certainly, I find a variety of churches, some built on healing ministries, some built on Pentecostal experiences like prophetic experiences and gifts of the Spirit, some built on fellowship, relationship. Other churches are built on worship, great worship, and, and things like this. One of the things that I thought was important when starting this church is that it would be built on the Word of God. I felt like as a pastor that the most important thing in the world for me as a pastor that's someday going to stand before God and give a testimony and give a, a statement about the people's lives that come to this church, is that we teach the people, thus saith the Lord God. And when you know what God says about business, and family, and children, and finances, everything, even your dreams, and your vision, your future, you know what God says, what God's plans are for you. It's just amazing, because all of a sudden now, if you really love God, you're going to really fall into the place where God would have you to be. And this church is built on the word of the Lord. Today, uh, this morning, during one of the services this morning, uh, Vicki and, and Roger, who do our CDs for years with us, stopped me and said, do you know when we started Hebrews? We started Hebrews August six years ago. No, excuse me, August three years ago. And we are in the sixth verse. We have a sixth chapter. We have a tendency around here to just 
minister the word of God in such a deep way that nobody's in a hurry. Can you imagine taking one year, half a year on, on, on one chapter? And that's what we've done, is we've taken a half a year on one chapter. That's the average speed right now. Did you know most churches would teach that in two sessions, if that? And yet this morning, like for an example, Pastor Dan just exploded with wisdom. The week before, Pastor Luke just exploded with wisdom. Last week, Deborah made a statement that just changed my life. It was point number three as she brought the word of God. Ben, if you didn't get that teaching from last week, she didn't miss a beat. And the point number three is that your marriage is like a test tube. And that your marriage is an example and a development of you and your character to see how you're going to fit into the kingdom of God. And then she goes back, if you remember, about the marriage, and, and she goes, takes us back to the book of Genesis, and where the wife was molded to shape or to be a person who is like her husband. God didn't pick an animal out there, didn't pick a dog or a cat or, or some other source of, of uh, uh, existence to be the wife of the man, but took that wife and made her in the image, if you will, made her in the very likeness, the Bible says, called her a helper to the husband. And then the brilliant part about that, I don't know if you got this last week, then she says, your marriage is getting you ready for your wedding, which is the bride of Christ being developed into the character of the husband, Jesus. I mean, that was an incredible revelation. I don't know if you picked that up or not last week, but I never really heard it like that in all years and all the things that we've done. And that was an amazing insight into the heartbeat of God. This is a time when your marriage is going to be, uh, yes, troubled, pressure, trials, but it's a development of your heart so that you can be the proper bride for the groom. I don't care if you're male or female, that's not the issue. Men, get over that. I mean, just like there's always kinds of scriptures that say the man and the men of God and all that, and women have to go along. You have to go along with the fact that you're going to someday be the bride of Christ. And we're being developed like, like, if you will, God took from the side and developed the woman to be in the likeness of man and his helper. And called it that way. And now you and I are the bride of Christ being developed in your marriage as an example of that. We also found out when, if you will, from the very first teaching, part number one, that without respect, the fear of the Lord you're never going to get anything done because everything's going to come at you. You're going to be mad at her because she doesn't look the way she used to look. Or mad at her because she doesn't cook the way she cooked. Or mad at him because he used to court you, but now he's on the couch snoring. You're mad at him because he doesn't do nothing. Mad at him because he used to be romantic. Now he's not romantic. Mad at her because she, you know, I mean, mad. There'll always be something to be disappointed about in marriage. And yet, we find oftentimes for centuries, people have been happy in marriages that didn't even have love in them, but because they kept their marriage by the things of God. In other words, you'll find in scripture, it wasn't a man finding a woman falling in love. It was usually something very unusual to our society. It was a marriage, if you will, that was set up by the parents. And there wasn't any love involved in it. But you did what you did because you respected your parents and their choice. And until you and I get to the place where we respect and reverence God more than our own feelings, more than whether or not your wife or your husband does what you want them to do, but you do your part because you love God so much, 
not because they fulfill what they do. And that's really an important thing, is reverence towards God. If you don't reverence God, then all the little problems with your husband or your wife are going to torment you. But you get past the problems because you're in love with God and you're doing what God would have you do because God got a plan for your future and it's a development of your life. In fact, in Ephesians 5th chapter, verse 21, just pop it up on the overhead. It says, submitting to one another, how? How do I submit to one another? How do I give in? How do I come under something that I think is abrasive or wrong? How do I just say yes to that and go on? Because I'm so in love with God that I can do that in the fear of the Lord. It's like I said the other day about Joseph. I don't remember who I was talking to. Here's Joseph, this young guy, he's a teenager. And he's sold off from his, his brothers, throw him in a pit, try to kill him, don't like him. He's sold off in Egyptian slavery. Comes from a very wealthy family. And his brothers are ugly and wanting to kill him, but he doesn't die. And they just decide to sell him into slavery into Egypt. When he gets into Egypt, here's something unusual that takes place, is he ends up at Potiphar's house. Potiphar is like the right hand of Pharaoh himself. Potiphar was the captain of all of, of the works and the head of all of the works of Pharaoh. He was like the, one of the most powerful men in all of wealthy Egypt. And don't you know this powerful man had an eagle? And don't you know he had material things? And don't you know his wife was a trophy wife? You could have anything he wanted. And his wife was probably a trophy wife. And she comes after young Joseph. She thinks he's good looking. And she wants to have sex with him. And she actually comes to him a number of times and says, let's lay together. And he says these words that were most fascinating. He didn't say, wow, man, I'm a teenager. I've been wondering what this is like. Here's an opportunity. This lady's after me, and why not? What have I got to lose? I'm in prison. Nobody cares much about me anyway. I mean, her husband's been good to me, but I've also made him money. I think I'll just do this. My hormones are going wild. I think I'll just give in to my feelings. I'll just, oh, why not? Who cares? He does it. He makes a statement. He says, I will not sin against my God. I mean, from that moment on, God knew that that boy had fear of God and there wasn't anything he would not do for the Lord and he could be trusted for the rest of his life. Becoming, remember, from the prison to the palace, the prime minister of all of Egypt from a prison cell. Guys, there's such a future ahead of you and I if we'll just get to the reverence place where this is not about whether Debbie performs the way I want her to perform or not perform. This is not about whether she thinks I'm cool or sees me as a, what was the word she used last week, bozo. <laughs> Doesn't matter about that. What it is, it's all about reverencing God. Staying in that relationship, doing your part, Hopefully and prayerfully, they'll get a hold of the other person of their part and they'll continue to glorify God because that's what this is really all about. I'm going to read you the next verses here, if I may, out of Ephesians in the fifth chapter because then I want to go somewhere today. I want to share with you one of the commandments. I really forgot to tell you this, John, back in the... Is John back there tonight? John Casca? Casca? Uh, John, I meant to tell you this, that if you could give me a commandment number one, and then, and it's to be the head. That's what it's called. Commandment number one, be the head. Because that's really what I want to take you to for you husbands. I'm going to read you the scripture. I'm going to give you some insight on this, and I want you to see it. If you will, let's take a look with me in verse number 22, wives, submit yourself to your own husband as to the Lord. Now, I'm not going there, but I'm going to let Deborah go there because she does a whole lot better job on that subject than me. Number 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, let the church be subject to Christ 
So let the wives be to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved their church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle, nor any such thing, but that she should obey, should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and they be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. In order to understand how a wife is ever going to get around to respecting her husband, which is the last commandment here, reverencing her husband, it starts way back with men being the way that they should be. So, and I'm going to take you, if I may, back, and I'm going to just bring you to verse number 23, if I could get that up on the overhead. For husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So here we find the Word of God making a, an analogy, if you will, of Christ and the church as a husband and the wife, as an example, a husband and wife. In fact, if you will, in verse number 32, let's take a look at that, if you will. This is a great mis mis mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church as he talks about the marital relationship. Have you ever wondered why marriages are always under attack they don't get along, man. You are an example in your marriage of Christ and the church. And don't tell me the devil doesn't work overtime trying to split you up. A house divided against itself will not stand. And so here we find that the principles of satanic principles that want to divide you, we need to be wise enough to realize there's something going on. And that Christ analogy for a marriage, husband and wife, is like Christ in the church. Now, if you don't understand the word church, if you're born of the Spirit of God, you're in the church of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about a place where you worship. If you go to the Rock Church and you say, well, I, I go to the Rock or I go to Calvary Chapel or I go to Harvest or I go some other place, hey, that, that's fine, but the it doesn't matter where you go or if you don't go anywhere. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you're part of the church of Jesus Christ. And you've got to understand that you are the body of Christ. We just work better together than we do by ourselves. So God collectively brings us together in a place called the church. We are the church, but we're in this place collectively bringing our gifts together. Now, if God cares a lot about the church, and he does, he also cares about the marriage, and he does. For an example, God, if he cares about the big overall church where people gather together, and in order for them to have some direction, in order to have them spiritually covered, in order for them to teach them the ways, in order for them, he gives them a shepherd, which is called, if you will, a pastor. You understand the principles of church. You understand the pastors. There's lots of good pastors. Every now and then there's a bad pastor. But there's a lot of good pastors out there. And so God cares about the condition of the body of Christ or the church. And he puts a head over the church for his spiritual guidance. It's the same principle in the home. In the home, the husband is like the pastor of that family. And that's what God says. You see, there is always order where there's God. If something's out of order, I guarantee it's not God. There is always order 
where there's God. You take sand off the beach and pour it in your eye, it's out of order. You take sand out of your eye, put it on the beach, it's where it belongs. And you'll find that there's always order where there's God. And God's order is kind of like, if you will, the example being used is Christ in the church. This is a great mystery. I speak as concerning Christ in the church. Well, here he finds a pastor, puts it over the church to take care of it. And then he finds a husband, put it over the family to take care of it. So the family, if you will, is covered by the order of God, which is the husband, who is like the pastor of that home. Now, most, pa most husbands don't act like pastors. But that's why we're here tonight, to find out the way to act. So here's the kind of the way this works. The husband is the pastor of the home. God gives a pastor over a church. But the ultimate shepherd pastor is Jesus himself. And he's our example. Are you following me? And so when he makes a statement like he does, if you'll go back with me in the verse number. 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. He's not just dictating that because he likes men better than women. He's making a statement of order. And where there's order, there's the presence of God. Where there's no order, there's no presence. And he says, the husband is the head or the, if you will, the pastor. And he says, I speak, and notice the rest of the verse. He says, as the head of the wife, and also Christ is the head of the church. Exactly the same thing. And he is the savior of the body. So, if you will, commandment number one for the men, I don't know if you have this or not, John, is to be the head. I forgot to tell you. That's the way it is. And a lot of men don't want to be the leader, pastor, head, spiritually of their family. In fact, Quite frankly, in America, most women are the spiritual pastor leaders of their homes. And that's a tragedy because what do we have? Out of order. Now, so there's something that's calling. Like for an example, let's talk about it for a minute. A woman has no problem following a man and giving in to a man who is the spiritual leader of their home. A woman has a hard time submitting to a man. And of course, that's all they've ever heard. Submit to the man, submit to the man, submit to the man. Let me tell you, a hard time submitting to a man that's not a godly man. And the problem is that we men are trained more by the world, more by our parents, more by our relatives, more by the things around us and past experiences than we are. Watch me now, watch me now, watch me now, than the word of God. And you're going to have to love God so much to, to change your thinking about who you are and what you do and how you do it. Because how you do it makes it easier for a woman to submit to you. You do it wrong, man. There's no way she's going to submit to you and last. Does anybody listen? Very important for us to see. So the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and says, take them, that's you. To a verse about pastors, seeing they're going to be pastors. And I started reading it and I thought, oh my goodness, this is the description of the head of the family or a pastor. And it just went off on the inside of me. Yes, I'm going to read to you about a pastor, but if you're married and in your family and want to be the spiritual leader, you're going to have to start to see yourself as the pastor of your family. Woman will have no problem following a real man of God. Woman has a real problem following a joker. And you might as well know that. If you're having problems with a woman who loves God and is having a hard time following you, it's your problem. Because you're not being where you need to be. And I know that's a blunt, overall, harsh statement, but it's still very true. And so as we look at the Word of God, I'm going to be reading to you out of 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. Mostly verse number 2. So turn there in your Bible with me, and let's take a look at what a pastor does with a church, because this is like Christ and the church. And if he cared enough about the 
church to put pastors over it. He cares enough about the family to put a leader or pastor over that. And it's the same principles that apply in a marriage as apply to pastors. And it says this in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, verse number two, shepherd the flock of God. See where it says flock of God? You might want to just circle it, make a little note, and say family. There's some key words in here in verse number two that I, I want to share with you tonight that are very important for you to get a picture of your position as a man. Very important. The first one is the word shepherd. Shepherd the family. A shepherd is somebody who protects and guards and guides the sheep to a healthy place. The family. A shepherd is one who carries a staff to fight off and protect in every direction. Provide for. A shepherd is someone who the sheep could trust, a herd of sheep could trust. God being the ultimate shepherd, David writes in Psalms 23, and I think it's fascinating, he writes these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I guess the very first question to all the men that are in here tonight, let's be honest with each other. We've had a lot of fun, we've laughed. Is really the Lord your shepherd? Or is he just somebody that's out there and you're your own shepherd because really until you get to the place where you submit out of reverence to his will instead of your will it isn't going to work anyway you're going to have to get out of yourself like if you, like joseph who probably had strong sexual feelings said no man i'm not going to sin against my god and he took god's way better than his own way and you and i are going to have to come to a place where we do this god's way and not our own way the Lord is my shepherd. And then guess what? When he really is your shepherd, when he really is your pastor, when he is really the man that you follow, that is there for you, then he comes along and makes this statement. And he says, I shall not want. You talk about building security. I, I've done that all my life with Deborah. It's just part of me. It's just built on the inside of me. I don't want her to want for anything. In fact, she usually doesn't want anything. I give her all kinds of stuff. She says, I don't want that. Well, I'm thinking to myself, you ought to want it. But it's just what's in me. I want. I shall not want. In other words, because there's satisfaction in the life. Go on, verse number two. And it says, he makes me to lay down green pastures. Laying down is a place of comfort. But not just any place. You know, you can be comfortable in the desert. But here, the shepherd takes the sheep, the family. The pa a husband takes the wife, family, children. He does something. He makes them lie down and rest in comfort in a place where there's plenty. A lot of times we just want to throw our hands up and say the economy stinks. But... I think a, a woman really respects a man that will get out and do whatever he needs to do to get the job done. I, I remember my friend Larry Reynolds. Some of you know Larry Reynolds. He had graduated with his wife from Stanford University. He's a black guy that goes to our church. Graduated from Stanford University. His wife went back to the South to finish her, her doctorate's degree to be a medical doctor. And while they were in the South, here's this college graduate from Stanford that uh, couldn't get a job while she was in medical school. The only job he could fit into was being a, if you will, a maintenance person, a janitor. And he went to work as a janitor, college degree, and they saw him as a black janitor, period. That's the way it was. And he fit that role for them so he could provide for his wife while she finished medical school. Today, you know, you look at Larry Reynolds and Larry Reynolds Sports Agency is one of the large sports agencies in America that has all the baseball players 
signed up, and Tory Hunter that you just watched on television, and guys like that. He's the manager of all these people. You know, you, you don't get that because you know baseball. You get that because you know God. Yeah. And here's this man, if you will, that I admire and have loved from the moment I met him because he was willing to go to work as a janitor. And sometimes, you know, when it says these words, you can't just go in and make the wife lie down and comfort in a green pasture. But if she knows you're trying, not sitting at home doing nothing, if she knows you're trying to get her into that place, man, I'm telling you, she'll submit right and left. But she'll resist you if you put up excuses. He leads me beside still water. This is a shepherd. Still waters where there's no, there's no sediment in it. There's no garbage. There's also, again, benefit, cooling, refreshing place. Listen to what the shepherd does. Takes the sheep, or here's, here's a better illustration. Look what the husband does with the family. Takes the family to a place of refreshment. In verse number three. It says, he restores my soul. In other words, when the soul is attacked and under pressure and not doing well, he's there as an encouragement. He leads me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, here's the shepherd once again. Here's the, here's the husband. Here's the pastor of the church. Here's, here's Jesus. And what does he do? He takes us and he leads us in a path of righteousness. Not on righteousness. Not on godliness. Not junk and crap. But also the things of God. That's what he's talking about there. We have such an easy idea about things. We can just lead our family someplace because we want to go there. We want to be involved in it. We want the sensation of it. We want to do our thing instead of leading them into a place of righteousness. You know, husbands, ask yourself, are you leading your family, leading your wife into a place of righteousness? Are you putting her in a, in, in a compromised position where she feels filthy about herself after being involved in something she should not be in? Come on, stop messing with me. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. Yeah. Sit there and baby cake and patty cake all you want, but this is the facts. And you may not like it, and you may not even ever come back to this church. Oh well, we'll be healthy without you. But you won't be healthy without us. And that's the shame. So somebody needs to get in your face and tell you about how this is. Leading your wife into a place of righteousness means you get involved with the things of God, not the garbage of this world. Come on, somebody. Verse 4 comes up. It says, Yea, though if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't we as families... Aren't there ups and downs? Aren't there homes that are lost? Isn't there financial chaos all the time? Have you ever figured it out? We don't have a lot. We're broke half the time. Most people fight over being broke. Who cares? God said he'll supply your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Take a chill pill and cool out for a while. He says, oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow. And then he comes along and says, I'll fear no evil. You know what you need to do? Make sure your wife is in a place where she's not fearing this world. They're looking for you as a covering. We'll talk about that later. For you are with me. You, listen to this. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, they're there to protect. Verse 5. Although he says that he prepares a table in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Who prepares a table when the enemy is upon you? Things are precious. In other words, you've got such a confidence in God to take care of your home, family, children. Oh my goodness, you can prepare the table. Your cup runs over. Verse number six, last verse. And it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Why? Because I have a shepherd. This ought, to, this ought to be the cry of every woman. And then, can I say something? A woman's to follow the man. How could she follow the man unless the man's leading her to a place of righteousness, comforting her, bringing her to those paths of places, uh, doing his very best to take care of her, and, and being the spiritual leader of the house. Are there going to be problems? Yes. 
Are there going to be crisis? Yes. Is garbage from the past going to come up in your wife or your husband? You bet. But guess what? My Bible says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, you start dwelling in the house of the Lord the moment you get saved, not when you go to heaven. And that's what we miss all the time. We always think we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord when we die and go to heaven. Can I tell you something? In, 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 the Bible says you're seated at the right hand of Jesus now. So everything. So just like a husband is a shepherd to his wife, just like a pastor is a shepherd over his church. If I could take you to the amplified version of this verse, it's really quite cool. This is the Amplified. First Peter, the fifth chapter, if you will, the second verse, just that, just pop that up in the Amplified. Listen to what it says. I love the Amplified. Guys, it had to be written by a girl. I mean, that's like, they, like tons of words, but they're all good words, you know. The Bible's a little thing in King James, it's a long thing in the Amplified, you know. It, Written out. So this is mostly women's favorite translations. Ten. Nurture. Guard. Guide. The fold. That's the pastor's job. But that's the husband's job. The flock of God. That's just the family. That is your responsibility. Not by coercion or constraint but willingly. Go to the next part. Not dishonestly mo motivated by the advantages and profits belonging to the office, but eagerly and cheerfully. And it's just such a powerful verse. I love the first part. Go back to A, if you will, for me on that one, which, John, tend, nurture, guard, guide, fold. Bring forth out of the wife very best that God has. Let me tell you about women, men. They need to be encouraged. They need to be and know that God's in control. They love you, but they love you more when they know God's behind you. That you're making a decision not based on your emotion, but making a decision based that God has spoken to you as the head of the house. God will do great things. If you'll go back to the original, let's take a look at the original, if you will, of 1 Peter 5, 2. And there's some really interesting words there. Number, verse number 2, not only shepherd, that was the first word. The second one was serving. I'm just going to go through these as a thought. That if you're a pastor, there ought to be a serving attitude. If you're a husband, there ought to be a serving attitude. A lot of times, we have an idea in our mind, the wife is there to serve the husband, when in fact it ought to be the husband serving the wife. What can I do for you today? What do you want me to do for you today? How do you, how do, what, do you, what is it you want? Because remember, we're talking about personal self-sacrifice is love. And we're gonna talk about it more because it says, love your wife as Christ loved the church, well, how did life Christ love the church? Personal self-sacrifice. The giving of himself for the betterment of someone else. And so here we find the wonderful word called serving. And notice this, serving as an overseer. An overseer is somebody who has an attitude that watches over and protects his family. Very important. It really is saying exactly what we read in Psalms 23. He's a protector. He's an overseer. He sees the condition of his kids. He sees the condition of his wife. He gets them back to church. He, let me tell you something. There were no options in my family. My kids wanted to play sports. I said, hey, fine, you can play sports, but you cannot play sports when there's a church day. No way. I give a flip about you playing soccer or baseball. You're not going to be a professional anyway. <laughs> and we go to church. And I, as the head of the house, had to make that decision. And Deborah backed me 
I mean, I'm an ex-professional baseball player. You would think I'd be really into sports with my kids. But there was something I was really into more than sports for my kids. It was God. And you know what it sent? It sent a signal to my kids that number one important thing in this planet is God. Not some sports or give up God or make him compromise. I had to make those decisions. I had to be the overseer that said, listen, it's not good for my kids to be out there playing a baseball game when they could be in a church raising their hands to God. Now, they, can I tell you something? They did not raise their hands to God when, when they were little, but they do today. And that's the difference. And you know what? There's no baloney behind that at all. You don't have a lot of people say, well, you know, you got to live a compromised life. You got to live a little baseball, a little soccer. It's okay. We'll give up. You know, we'll go to church. Let me tell you something. You have the ability to be in a church that has 11 services a week. We're here all the time. Don't tell me you can't come on Saturday instead of Sunday to get the word of God for your kids. You're planting something in your kids without being the proper overseer. What you're doing is you're sending a kid a signal that says, just be a good sport. Learn competition. Learn how to uh, kick the ball well. Listen to this. This is what it needs to be like. Instead of learning what that is and be important with God, it's more important to be with God than to kick a ball anytime. So it's your kids. But an overseer leads his family in righteousness. Doesn't lead his family in sports. Now I don't have a problem. You say, well, I got a Sunday game. Good, come to Saturday. Well, I got a Saturday game. You better go to Sunday. Well, see, most people come along and say, well, man, I only have two days off or one day off. I'm exhausted. I can't go. Let me tell you something. You're sending a signal to your wife, a signal to your husband, uh, to your, to your uh, kids, as the husband and the head and the pastor of the church. You're saying if you're tired, you're, you're being tired is more important than your family getting God. And that's wrong, my friends. And that's what an overseer does willingly stops and looks and evaluates what his family is like and says, no, what we're going to do is we're going to put God first in every area. Then you can play soccer. Then you can play baseball. Then you can go out for the football team. Then you can go. I remember, this is such a sad story. A horrible story. I remember a pastor. It was a friend of mine. Deborah and I were between churches, went to his church. I'll never forget it as long as I live. After church, he says to me, come on to my house. We'll go have dinner, but first we've got to go to the house. They ran to the house to watch the end of a football game. And they were more into this football game than they were into the conversation about Jesus. And I'll never forget the whole family was so compromised. This is a pastor and his wife and his kids. Listen to this. The kids grew up and murdered a policeman. He's in prison to this day for life. You know why? Because somebody showed them a compromised position. This is what I'm talking about. This is a very serious thing. The devil is after your kids, after your marriage, after your future, after everything. And you're going to have to fight to get to where you need to be. And it's a fight that says God first. Overseer, oh no, man, I got to do my thing. I don't have time for God. You just sent a signal to God, and you just sent a signal to your family. I'm too tired to go to church. Guess what? You just sent a signal to God that you're too tired, and your your feelings are more important than God's worship, and and, and you just compromise. Your whole family picked up on that. All of your kids picked up on that. Your children, they may not ever say one thing to you, but they'll get it. And down the road. When they grow up, they'll be compromised. Worst thing you can do as an overseer is say, well, I'm going to raise my kids when they get older and let them make a decision. The devil loves you to say that. He's going to work on them over time while you're shutting your mouth, not saying anything about Jesus. The devil is planting every filthy, dirty, rotten thing in their soul so they never grow up to serve God. And the fault of that is yours. Am I being too mean? Just trying to get you guys to realize something here. You're the pastors of the church until you take authority of it. 
It isn't going to work. You got every little sports thing going on, every little click thing going on, every little party at night, too tired going on. Then you wonder why you can't lead your family in the, in the green fields to, for comfort and righteousness. Whew. It's overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. I love that. I willingly am going to go for God with all of my heart. I can't make you do this. Nobody can make you do this. Everything you do with God has got to come from your heart. Let me say it again. Everything you do for God has got to come from your heart. One more time. Everything you do has got to come from your heart. It doesn't come out of robotic uh, traditions and religions and ceremonial ritual. Now you have dead religion. And it'll never work. But if it comes out of your heart, we're going for God. Yes, I'm tired, but we're going for God. Yes, I know you want to be at that game. We're going for God. Yes, I know that you're, you're, you're not going to go because God's more important. We're not going to insult God. And it comes from your heart, man. There's great fruit. Amen. Willingly. And then it says, not for dishonest gain. I understand that as far as pastors because there's a lot of advantages to the office. People use their office to get a lot of stuff that they want for themselves. But what do they mean by that? Here's what God spoke to me. When you want something for nothing. In other words, you want someone in your family do something for you when you haven't done what you need to do. <laughs> That's a dishonest game. Now, you can get anything you want as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do. And that's what most people don't understand. And then it goes on, if you will, verse number three, it, it says this, it says, nor being lords, in a small l. In other words, a dictator in your house is not going to work, is it? In tr though, to those that are trusted. God trusts you with that wife. God trusts you with those kids. Who else is going to take care of them if you don't? You say, well, nobody. Wrong answer. There's one. His name is Jesus. And that's the problem. You've got to bring Jesus into every decision-making process that you have. Because, back to number one, you reverence, respect, and love him more than you do your own feelings. Is anybody listening? Amen. And then the last word is an example. Without mom and I, man, listen, we have fought for years. We don't really fight, 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 you know. She just gets mad at me and walks away mumbling. I always wonder what she's saying when she's mumbling. She's probably gone back to those high school words. <laughs> but she doesn't know what I'm mumbling as she walks away. I'm, I'm actually repenting for the high school words. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we'll get at each other, but we'll always stay in love. And that's what this is all about. And we're an example of a good marriage. I remember my oldest daughter, Miranda, who's married to Pastor Henny now. And they have a church in Tobacco. She went through a bad marriage. She would not listen as an 18-year-old. You know what that's like? Any parents know what I'm talking about. Would not listen, didn't give a flip, didn't care about anything. Went and got her nose bloody out there in the world, got married, had a baby, came home. Husband gone off with some other guy, broke her heart. And uh, she said these words to me. She said, Dad... All I want is a marriage like yours and mom. You don't get it, something like that from your kids unless the word example becomes very important. You are the only example your family will read. The kids are going to sit down and memorize scripture. They're going to see you live it, hear you pray it, see you, hear you talk it. You're the example. So oftentimes, we as Christians want the end results, like somebody's going to wave a magic wand over our heads and we just get the results that we want. Or come up and I'll pray for you and anoint you with oil and all of a sudden the world is just going to change. Never works that way. It works because you become the pastor of your family. And you take that position seriously. And let's go back to Ephesians Verse 23, and this number one commandment is to the husband here, to be the head of the house. God would never have asked you to be the head of the house. Now watch this, listen to this, listen to this. 
God would never have asked you to be the head of the house. Are you hearing me? God would never have asked you to be the head of the house if you couldn't be the head of the house. You can be the head of the house if you believe God and do what God would have you to do. You'll never be the head of the house if you don't start believing God to be the head of the house. And that's where it comes in and it says, wives, submit yourself to the husband. You're going to have to come along. You're going to have to let him be the head of the house. Deborah will talk about that. For husband is the head of the wife. How? As also Christ is the head of the church. And because he was head of the church, he put a pastors over it. Just like the husband is the pastor of the house. And he is the savior, savior of the body. So all of a sudden we find ourselves seeing Jesus Christ as one. Do you know there's families to be rescued, marriages to be healed. I really believe with all my heart it starts with men being the head of the house. All you have to do is jot those down. Think about it. God's called you to be a willing overseer. Lead your family into righteousness and green pasture. To get in there and make it happen. Putting God first. Putting the things of God first. Making sure they're fed properly. If you see something going out of whack, then find out how you can get it right with God. Do what you need to do and watch God do great things. I'm finished for tonight. If you got anything, give the Lord a great big praise. You know make sure everybody's all right with God, so here's how it's going to work. If you're not right with God, let's get right with God. Period. I, I, I want you to be honest with yourself. Your relationship, here's, here's, what, here's what you need to see. Your relationship with God stinks. If you die, you hope you're going to go to heaven. That's a stinking relationship. You're not going to make it, because you can't get there because you hope. You've been out of sync with God doing your own thing instead of God's thing. And you really need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Period. That's you and you know it. In order to get your life together, you're going to have to start off with the most important thing that gets life together. The creator of life. Jesus Christ. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Come on, let's be honest with each other. That's what this is really all about. Give him all of your heart. And give him all of your life. And if you haven't done that, tonight's your night. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'll pray with you right in your seat. And then afterwards you can come up because we're late. But I want you to at least acknowledge that. If that's you and you want me to pray for you tonight. To lead you in a prayer. Right in your seat. You don't have to move. To give your heart and life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand when I count to three. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? You've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life. You're one of those people that are in here, you're not sure about your relationship with God. you got some wishy-washy relationship with God. You want it to be fired up and strong. You always make the wrong decisions instead of the God decisions. Then you need to get your hand up. Put it right back down and I'll pray with you. All across this auditorium, it's your call, your choice. Couldn't get any simpler. But tonight you need to give God once and for all, all of your heart and all of your life. I'm counting to three right now. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Twelve, thirteen. Thank you. Back over here. Fourteen. Thank you. 15, right here. God bless you. There, back in here, there's some more. Wave at me if you're down in this. Oh, there you are. 16, 17, good. There's 17 wise people. Let's bow our heads and pray. Everybody, all 17 of you, especially you, I want you to get a, the hold of these words. I'm going to go slow and say them out loud. Say, Father God. Father God. Now, now, everybody say it. Say, Father God. Father God. I come to you. In the name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, I believe that he died for me. I believe he's your only begotten son. I believe 
His blood washes away my sins. I repent. I turn from evil. And I turn to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again believer. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I have the victory. And I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven. Now give the Lord a great big praise. 17 of you. Joel, come here.